Welcome to episode six of the Tech Bubble. Today we'll be discussing the impending introduction of coding, or more specifically, computer science to South Island School. How and why are we making this change, specifically at this time, of course? And what opportunities does a subject like computer science offer to our students, and why? Has Sam Bonnerkamp been invited back onto this <laughs> show again? Who knows? I can't These are just away. some of the questions we will tackle as he ignores Sam Bonnerkamp in the background on the tech bubble today. <laughs> I'm your host, Ian Williamson, and today we are joined by five coding experts. First, we're joined by our very own tech whiz, Tom Lee, the current tutor of 8S2. Tom arrived at South Island back in 2004, and before the Chinese department made him one of their own, he taught ICT back in the days when South Island had ICT. He is a graduate in information systems from Massey University, New Zealand, and has expertise in system design and programming, of course. Unsurprisingly, he has been a force for incorporating coding at our school, uh, having been an advocate for this over many, many years, which I can testify personally. A pleasure to invite you on the show today, Tom. Good to see you. Thank you for having me. With him, we have William McIntosh of 11B1. Will is another big advocate of coding in school and has some strong skills in this area, having landed a part-time job for artificial intelligence company Bluefire. Sadly, he's going to be leaving our school in the summer to join Hills Road School in Cambridge. A loss for us, a gain for them. But he has promised that when he is hacks and faceless corporations, redistributing wealth in the world as per Fight Club, that he will make sure I have a comfortable pension. You are a good guy, Will. Welcome to the Tech Bubble. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. I'm excited to talk about all these topics. How yeah. do you about your new school, Will? I mean, are you excited to be moving back to the UK or... You know, will you be keeping in contact with us all in Hong Kong? How do you feel about it all? Yeah, I mean, obviously it's going to be terrible leaving Hong Kong and leaving all my friends, but it'll be great to have this new opportunity. I think that when you're always moving like that, I think what you just said is, is perfect. You're obviously looking at it in a positive way. And, you know, if you look at it in a negative manner, then yeah, it's probably not going to be a great experience. But you're trying to turn the potential negative of leaving Hong Kong into a positive by going to the UK. And I'm sure you'll, you'll make a big success of that. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Moving on, Paul Kim from 12N2 joins us. Paul has been a passionate member of our coding club here at South Island School, taking advantage of all the extracurricular opportunities afforded to him. So much so that he successfully landed a role supporting the ESF Computer Conference over the last year. Indeed, it may well be that Paul leads this initiative in the 2020-21 academic year. Plenty to discuss on that score later in the show. So welcome, Paul. Hello, and thank you for having me. You are welcome. Good to have you on the show. Christy Poon of 10N2 emerged as one of our most talented young coders as part of the coding club during the last two years. Having surpassed my skill level after about, oh, about 10 minutes, I decided she required a new mentor. And with Tom Lee busy with his badminton club, had no choice but to ask Sam. 15 minutes later, she surpassed Sam too. Unsurprisingly, Christy will be taking over the coding club in 2020-21 whilst receiving some free tuition from BSD as part of the deal. Sweet, eh, Christy? Hi. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And finally, who else do we have today? Finally, um, oh yes, we have Sam Bonacamp, the man behind the one and only South Island School eSports tournament, alongside Will, coincidentally, and the long-term leader of our coding club. Next to Tom Lee, I can't think of anyone who has fought harder than Sam to bring about the introduction of computer science to South Island School. A great advocate, at least in the afternoons, as he tends not to do mornings. Welcome back for a record-breaking third time, Sam. Hello. Hello, dear listeners. I hope you're not bored of me just yet. No, we've not had any messages to suggest, so, um, so you're still safe for now. Okay, now that we've established the coding pedigree of our guests, let's begin by considering the how and the when of computer science at South Island School. Tom, can you tell us something of the background story leading to our school leadership team giving the green light for coding? Uh, yes, we visited KG5 back in uh, late November 2019. Uh, we can see um, year 7, year 8 and year 9 students in KG5. They have a chance to learn about computer history. 
desktop publishing, working with Microbit. Students also learn about digital citizenship and had the opportunity to learn programming. In um, year 10 and year 11 in KG5, students would take a more academic approach to computer science when they can choose to do the Cambridge IGCSE. Students also had a chance to learn Python, another exciting and useful programming language. In IB, computer science remains a very popular group 4 option in KG5. Um, the language, um, computer language used by some students is uh, JavaScript and PHP. And with other popular options like Java and Python, Back in uh, January 2020, Ian and I had the opportunity to present our findings from the visit to KG5 to our uh, South Island uh, leadership team and made uh, suggestions on how we can bring computer science, IGCSE and IBDP into South Island. The meeting went uh, smoothly and the decision on bringing computer science to South Island school is uh, unanimous. We will have Cambridge IGCSE computer science as a year 10 subject in August 2021. The course allows students to develop their understanding of the main principles of problem solving using computers. They can apply their understanding to develop computer-based solutions to problems using algorithms and a high-level programming language. It is also highly possible that we will have IB computer science in August 2023 for our year 12 students. Overall, this is great news for students, parents and South Island School. Uh, fantastic news. So I, I guess having established that computer science is coming to uh, SIS in August 2021, I guess the logical follow up that many of our listeners may be considering is obviously, you know, why? You know, more specifically, why is computer science and more widely coding suddenly so important to the school curriculum? Sam, you've talked about this quite a bit, not only in Coding Club, but also through the DLC and, you know, even mentioned it a couple of times in previous shows. So, you know, what would be your answer to that question? What, why do we need coding now? Well, honestly, in my opinion, I don't think that we need coding. I think rather that we need the option to need coding. So that is to say that every student has the ability to pursue this if they want to, right? Because programming from its first, let's say, in conception or inception um, back in the 90s, programming has always been this kind of thing that was extremely hard to get into, right? Because learning a language after knowing nothing is is a gargantuan task. So um, I, I think... i you there, Sam, and point yeah, out... Sure. That I was coding back in the 1980s on my ZX Spectrum. And once I had then upped my game, well, I've moved from a 16K ZX Spectrum to a 48K ZX Spectrum, and then on to an Atari 800XL, I had lots of opportunities in the 1980s as well. Sorry, I just had to point that in there and, and name drop a little bit in terms of my own computer history. Back well, to you, Sam. Uh, I guess I've just been owned then. <laughs> but you've obviously started with programming, as you just mentioned, but it's hard to turn that into something useful. That is to say, into like a career or something like that, right? And so I think adding this to the curriculum and giving people the option is great for students who already have a little bit of technical knowledge, who want to expand that and perhaps turn that into something that they do for their income in the future. Okay, interesting response. Paul, why do you think that is that computer science is suddenly so important in our school curriculum? Well, I really wanted to address the aspect of problem solving within uh, computer science. To me, like if we use like a typical coding example, you would have like a function that you would want to execute, but you struggle to translate how that function translate into code despite having it crystal clear in your head. So eventually you would go on the internet for some help. And that sort of shows that you're being resourceful and independent that you can problem solve on your own. The point is like the skill of problem solving independently and the ability to persevere and adapt quickly are all essential skills that one can obtain from programming are all useful for the workplace in the future. Do you think that coding and some of those problem solving skills that you just mentioned, Paul, do you think they have a place in, let's say, mathematics? Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, in fact, it's very common in mathematics. In fact, I sometimes view mathematics not as a subject of numbers and equations and everything. I view it as a skill. You, you as sound like an apprentice of Miss Vasil. Is that the kind of thing that she would like to hear? If I could interrupt just for a moment, I think what Paul said is actually really clever as well, because uh, programming, you mentioned programming as a way to also teach you how to do problem solving. But I also think in addition to that, programming is the medium by which you solve problems as well. So for example, for my maths IA, I had to do something about maths, right? So I decided to graph the, the growth of bacteria in agar jelly. 
And when I first pitched this idea to my teachers, they were like, oh, it's hard to measure how much bacteria there are in agar jelly. I asked some bio teachers and bio students, they were like, oh, it's hard to measure exactly what the increase is. And I was like, ah, I've got an idea. Why don't I write an image recognition software that will tell me the increase or the amount of bacteria that is currently in the agar jelly? So I did that and it worked. So programming as a means to solve problems is, is also one of the things that is really good about programming. It's versatility. Very good example. Very interesting case study that, uh, Sam. Tom, what, what, what do you think in, in terms of the relevance of coding right now? Yes, if I may, I would like to uh, comment on uh, Sam's IA solution. Yes, um, in real life, if you can actually adapt a programming skill, or should I say problem solving skill through programming, you can actually adapt it to many, many real life situations, or even math, Chinese, English, a lot of IAs. I can definitely remember uh, one time I was helping my wife in her company. She was managing human resource department and apparently there were some coins they need to calculate and they must calculate to the last exact coin because everything must be precise. And I actually wrote a program in Excel that actually calculates the number of coins that every single one of the staff will need and the total number of coins that my wife must get from the bank. And this is actually a good application of programming skill because if you do not use program to actually do that, 10 out of 10 times you will have error. You either have more coins left or you do not have enough coins from the bank. So this is a very good way of applying uh, programming in real life. Yeah, that's why I always like to say programming is great for lazy people because <laughs> if you have a job, right? For yeah. example, I work at BSD now as an intern mm. and my boss, thank you very much, Karen, he said, I've got 88 emails you have to send out to the students. And I was like, there's no way I'm doing this manually. So mm -hmm. I wrote my own Python bot and did it myself. So because I was lazy, I wrote a script to do it for me, which yes. is why I think programming is fantastic if you're lazy. <laughs> yes, and they are very, very good at repeating skills, at repeating tasks, and they can do it very, very accurately, assuming that you write the program properly. Exactly. Right? exactly. Yes, that's a, that's a very good thing. Parents, let's come back to Ian's question. I believe parents and students, they will welcome this decision and this change to our school's curriculum uh, with the adding of computer science. And of course, with their help, with their support, uh, some of the parents through email and meetings and conversations with the uh, leading team, they managed to help our school put computer science back into the, the IGCSE curriculum. So they did a very good job in doing that as well. Absolutely. I mean, I, I remember speaking to Fran Crouch, you know, this was about a year ago where we had a, an, an open evening where, you know, she'd been surrounded by parents who were, who were really kind of pushing for this. So I think the relevance is coming from, from all stakeholders. Well, I want to just come back on a point that was made earlier on very briefly, which is about the, the application of coding skills in the real world and in terms of jobs as well. Because when I started to realize this about three or four years ago when we had a guest speaker in school and he showed us a live update of the New York Times and the positions that were available. And there were actually far more coding positions, uh, jobs that required some kind of coding background than there were positions in journalism itself at the New York Times, which really, I think, shows you the changing nature of that industry. In the introduction, I mentioned just how important the coding club has been at our school. And in the absence of a discrete pathway in computer science, and it was interesting, Tom, you speaking there about Excel, incidentally, you know, and the use of that program, because that's been one that's been a perennial discussion point in school over the last 10 years in terms of where's its place. Do the science teachers teach it? Do the maths teachers teach it? And obviously, with the absence of, of ICT, sometimes it's perhaps maybe even fallen between the cracks. We've got several key players from the coding club who are with us today. Christy, I'm going to start with you. I suppose there's a couple of questions I've got here. Number one, why did you get involved in the first place? And also, can you tell us a little bit about the club in its kind of current form? Um, yeah, so Coding Club happens every Thursday evening at D82 um, during the activities period. And I joined in year eight because I just loved coding. And I actually did the Mad Week activity with BSD, where Sam was a student helper. <laughs> and I really enjoyed it, which led me to joining the club. I wanted to join because first I could code for an extra hour every week. So that was amazing to me. And second, I wanted to meet people who also liked coding as much as I did. And in Coding Club, we currently learn HTML, CSS, JavaScript with the help of the BSD platform, which creates a learning guide to help students learn and their interactive activities and projects that we can make to help make coding a more fun learning experience. 
And just a quick plug, I think we as in the DLC bought the license for everyone in school, right? So if you sign up to app.bsd.education with your school email, you have access to everything we've paid for. You can do them. You can do the projects and they should teach you how to program. So even without the coding club, if you're stuck at home, if you're bored, just hop on and try it out. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would definitely advocate that as well. It's interesting, you know, we, we, we're talking about the same programs there, but of course in the club, um, Sam, maybe you can talk to us in a moment about, you know, how it's changed over the last two to three years. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the levels of differentiation that are required there because, you know, you, you're, Chris, you've just been saying, you know, we learn HTML, CSS, JavaScript, etc. But we haven't really been limited to that, have we? I mean, the discussions that you two have had have moved way beyond that. You know, I, I see you both grinning when PHP was mentioned earlier on and several other language besides that. So I mean, how, how challenging was that for you, Sam, when you had the likes of Christy in your class on the one side, who is really asking for more now? You know, she's gone you know, through those kind of basic languages. She wants more. But at the other side, you're getting kids who are coming in, you know, maybe year sevens who have never really done much coding at all. And they're starting from, you know, week one on HTML or whatever. How, how did you find, you know, meeting the needs of those various different learners? Well, I think a major tool that helped me actually make it so that I could actually teach this many different languages to this many different people was the BSC online platform. Because mm -hmm. as um, Christy mentioned, it gives you the steps and everything. And, and it can, for motivated students, teach you without the need of a teacher which is the whole point of BSD Online. You know, we try to create a platform that students can learn from without the need of teachers who know a lot about programming. So that definitely allowed me, because then I could say, okay, hey, you can do this project now, they should teach you about this. They'll go off and do it. And if they need help, they'll call me. If not, they'll just keep working, which then I can turn around to Christy and say, hey, look, try doing the Fibonacci thing backwards in Python. Now you go do that. And then this and that. And I could keep giving people projects and then helping people. Sorry about that. Which allowed me to basically juggle the different students. Really you can't well. see this, by the way, all, all of our listeners, but Sam is becoming so excited about this whole conversation that he's slapping his hands down on the table. <laughs> That's the kind of levels of excitement we've got when we're talking about coding here. Paul, you were also a participant as part of the coding club. What, what, what kind of experience did you have? And was that important as part of your development in then getting involved in the ESF computer conference? Oh, yes, definitely. It wasn't just the SIS coding club last year. I've also uh, been part of BSD's ever, first ever visit to SIS. With that really started my journey in coding, starting with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And then I really never looked back from there. I also had another opportunity for Mr. Williamson That's with, me, everyone. with the uh, initiative to visit FDM group for an eight-week Python course as well, which was an amazing follow-up to what I learned the year before. All those skills sort of allowed me to access the environment that ultimately the ESF computing conference co sort of presented. It's been such an important element of what we've done in school in terms of starting to get that grassroots culture started up. When I first arrived in the school back in 2004, I remember part of my objective in, in taking over in those days, what was the media studies department, we, there was no IB film in those days, was to get you know, students excited about media and you know, producing more practical work and things like that. And it, it kind of took me five years to sort of get there. I kind of see at the moment that with the coding club that you two guys have been involved in, with the ESF computer conference that we've had, you know, a handful of you involved in. And, you know, I should also give a shout out here to Tom as well, because, you know, he's, he's also offered several enrichment activities over the years. And, you know, we've talked quite a bit about Python there. FDM obviously offered their eight week course, but, you know, Tom has also offered you know, the enrichment course as well. What was the sort of interest in that then, Tom? And what sort of uptake did you get? Were there a lot of students who were signing up for that? And, and how did you find that as the teacher in terms of the sort of engagement levels you had from the students? It was a great opportunity for me to meet students that show interest towards um, learning programming. I taught the Python as an enrichment program to some of the year 10, some of the year 11 students. Not a large number, but a good number of students. I noticed a number of talented young students in this field. And uh, the conversation that we had during lessons are always inspirational and, of course, memorable. And some of the students managed to you know, stay on and some of the students managed to make further decision in the later days. But yeah, it was a very, very good experience. I always enjoy teaching students something that they enjoy and something that I enjoy. It's amazing how different those languages are. Wouldn't you all agree that Python, going along to listen and, and learn a little bit of Python myself when I went down with Paul to FDM, is a language that almost felt like I was back in math classes. 
it was you know making me shiver a little bit to start with but i got over it i got over that <laughs> well things like html and css even javascript you know i mean the, the computer game that i learned to you know i i did a little fantasy role-playing game online at bsd before i then taught it with my year 11s and to me it's very interesting that as an arts-based teacher there's this immediate gratification when you're using programs like html and css you know you change the code and it looks different it's blue it's green it's red as compared to javascript where that immediate gratification is not quite the same way and for me as a, as a creative artist i had to you know kind of get beyond that Sam, I know you got some thoughts about this one. Yeah, actually, I was going to ask something, uh, Mr. Lee. One of the reasons why I don't teach Python right out the gate at my coding course is because the web dev languages, the things to make websites with, is a lot more easier to encourage students if they write something and then they immediately something visual on the screen. Because I know it takes a certain kind of person to get excited about text on the terminal. Now, that's not a diss. I am one of those people. But do you feel that it's kind of hard to encourage people to text on the screen? Woo! No, I find it very simple. I'm sure Paul still remember his first program. Paul, what was your first program? Hello World. Exactly. I mean, it depends how you deliver it, right? If you can find someone that can deliver it better, I'm sure you're going to remember it for the rest of your life. And yes, my first program was Hello World as well. And if you can design the course and deliver the course in a well-organized, fun way, I'm sure a lot of students will remember it and they can do it and they will find interest. And once you plant that seed in them, they can just grow even without a teacher because uh, the resources are everywhere these days. Yeah, and of course, there is also the BSC platform. I agree. And it's, I think it's nice that we're, we're using words like fun as well, because I think for some students, maybe the thing that puts them off initially, and I know certainly in media, since we've, we've incorporated coding into, into our curriculum, there's often that slight fear factor. And I have to say, one of the most gratifying things that I've seen in class is this sort of flattened classroom where as a teacher, you've got to be prepared, I think, to let go of it. And I know that there are stronger coders in the class than me. And it's great when you see students who are going around and then they are offering advice to other students. Students who then come to the fore who are maybe not the best filmmakers in media, potentially, you know, haven't come to have their you know, moment in the sun until that point, but who then end up end with like nearly full marks in the coding unit. So the opportunity for students to share knowledge between each other is, is fantastic. That said, having a discrete pathway in computer science, I think we're crying out for. You can move so much more quickly if you've got a specialist in the room, you know, like, like yourself, Tom. I want to come back to the uh, ESF computer conference just briefly. Paul, coding is clearly, you know, not just a priority for us here at South Island. And I know that the ESF computer conference really has students taken not only from our own school, but West Island, KG5, Sharton College, just to name but a few. It seems to me that the students of the ESF are really invested in the importance of coding. So I think it would be important for our, our audience just to find out a little bit more about where we are with the ESF COCO, because obviously it didn't really happen this year, did it, in the way that we'd hoped. So can you first of all maybe give us a, a, a sort of quick update on, on the situation there? Before I answer, I just want to give a brief introduction of what the ESF Computing Conference is, just for the listeners who don't really know it. It's an event comprising programming workshops from various different coding academies and IT centers around Hong Kong. Also talks from Hong Kong technologists and a hackathon where students can put their coding skills to the test. And with regards to your question, Mr. Williamson, that's a very tough question to answer at this, at this time. And I'm genuinely just uncertain about the circumstances of holding such an event in the next academic year. I have spoken to the current event manager and he was considering handing the event manager role to me though no, I am not sure of that either. Worst case scenario that we have to restart the event preparation from scratch. But I'm planning to, to use a similar approach that our manager had regarding the event last year, which was to narrow it down to one or two areas of computing, such as data, uh, finance, or computer science specifically. But currently, I do not have a realistic date for the ESF uh, computing conference of, in the year 2020 to 2021. Okay, thanks for that update, Paul. I mean, maybe one of the things we can do is we can talk about that again in some future show. Uh, maybe uh, at the beginning of the next academic year. because I'm, I'm sure there'll be a lot of students who'd be interested from our school. This, would, incidentally, everyone would be our third ESF computer conference. The first two were held at South Island School, which was brilliant. This one was going to be held either at KG5 or at some kind of um, exciting corporate venue. But as we said, obviously, uh, the, the pandemic put pay to that for this year. Will, you've been part of that team as well. If you can maybe tell us a little bit about your participation in it. And also, what, what do you think the appeal of something like the ESF Computer Conference is for students? 
Yeah, so um, my role in the ESF Computing Conference team was the Director of Logistics. So I was basically in charge of making sure everyone stayed on top of their deadlines, produced all the work they needed to in order to actually make the event happen. But then obviously, you know, that didn't come to fruition because of COVID. When it comes to the appeal of the event, I think the main appeal of events like the ESF Coco is the fact that it's a large gathering of people with the same interest computing, as well as taking into consideration the hackathon, where people can form groups with their friends and just spend a day or two working solely on their project. Then at the awards ceremony, just seeing their accomplishment, yeah, just when the project that they spend so much time on finally comes out. I agree with that. It's great when people get together who are passionate about the same thing in any circumstances, whether that's the filmmaking that we see happening up on the eighth floor or artwork on the seventh floor and exhibitions and things. And it does tend to bring the best out of people, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. I'm just sort of thinking back to a couple of weeks ago when we were on the show and we discussed the future of work in our society and and the role of tech. One of the things that, that I was kind of expecting in some ways that we would probably talk a little bit about today is what do you think that coding, I guess, as a skill set is going to offer in the future? And, you know, how do you see these skills being used in our society? We talked a little bit about that. I talked about the New York Times as an example earlier on. But does anyone here have any particular examples where they think that coding is going to have like a big bearing on the future? I actually did a little bit of a research on this. So Stephen Hawking once said, whether you want to uncover the secrets of the universe or you just want to pursue a career in the 21st century, basic computer programming is an essential skill to learn. And as coding is becoming a valuable skill to this data-driven generation, so are the people with coding skill. And of course, I believe coding is the language of the modern world, or should I say the future, whether it's the app that brings email to your mobile phone or the car that knows how many miles to go until refueling. All smart devices need coding instructions to tell it how to operate and communicate with the outside world. So, yeah, I do actually. And to an extent, I do agree with you. I do agree that every person nowadays has to have at least a little bit of computer knowledge, like how to use a computer, how to troubleshoot bugs, whatever. But I don't think that necessarily programming is going to be instrumental in the future. I think quite the opposite. I think the future is heading to a place where you have to do less and less programming. So for example, there's a course that's often being done teaching right now. It's called Thunkable. It's a way to do app development. And the way it's done is similar to Scratch, right? Where you have like these blocks and you place them. And so dear listeners, if you know Scratch, it's like that. If not, Google Scratch. I think we're moving towards a world where the average person will have to do less and less programming themselves. Everything will be far more automated and ready and simple for the end user. But I do think that the world will rely more on programming. Yeah, it's an interesting point, Sam. It makes you wonder, doesn't it, whether the development of computer programming skills is going to be a little bit like the evolution of surfing the internet. You know, if you go back to its evolution in the 80s and then the launch of Netscape in the mid-90s and then the user experience becoming easier and easier to use. I suppose if you're talking about a kind of scratch-like interface, you know, it's designed for its its ease of use, isn't it? Yeah, if you look at things like MySpace, I think MySpace, you could write your own HTML and stuff like that to customize your page and all that. But nowadays, if you look at social media, you have no such options and everything is pretty much drag and drop. It's much easier for you as a user to customize your page in comparison to, for example, MySpace. But that being said, somebody had to program this functionality in. Programmers will still definitely be needed, but the average person will need to know computers, but what does not necessarily need to interact with code directly. That's uh, not to say you shouldn't learn it, though. It's a great skill to learn. Okay, if I can be a little bit more specific now, I've sort of alluded to this earlier on in the, in the show, this kind of plethora of different coding languages to learn, yeah? So when I'm up in D82 with, with Christy and Sam on a Thursday evening, you know, these two debate this endlessly. And I suppose I was kind of keen to know which languages you all feel are the most important ones and which are the most accessible to learn. Sam, you talked earlier on about trying to make things visual, at least for coders to begin with. But we're talking more now about, you know, once you've developed some coding skills, you know, where do you feel that you've had those breakthrough moments where particular languages have really lent themselves to you and you feel very comfortable perhaps with the syntax that's required in in those areas? Christy, maybe if we could have a start, start with you. Um, My favorite language is Java. It's high level. You can do a lot with it. I remember when I first told Sam about it, he was skeptical. He was like, no, this is terrible. No, I'm I'm never going to learn it. And then eventually I convinced him to learn it. 
he added it to like the bottom of his summer bucket list. And then <laughs> later he was like, oh my gosh, Java is the best thing I've ever discovered. I love it so much. I, it is amazing. It's better than Python. It's better than anything else I've discovered. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Okay, hold on, hold on. Java, great language. Language is great. The rest of it is an utter mess. Maven, Gradle, no. combination is it's, it's too confusing for me. For me, the real deal is C. No. But only because I, I think I hate myself a little bit here because C is very, very low level. So you have to deal with memory management and that kind of stuff. So my favorite language is C. But I think what language you use for a particular thing depends on what you're trying to do. Cool. If you're trying to write a simple little script to do an email for you, write it in Python. If you want to make money, do it in Java. If you hate yourself, do it in C. <laughs> Will, what, what, what's your thoughts on this? Yeah, I would just say that for beginners mainly, definitely Python, right? It was built for beginners, or not necessarily for beginners, but to simplify languages like C and C++. So as Sam said, yeah, it's good for writing simple scripts, but then there's also, you know, added libraries that you can learn and just there's a lot of functionality there that it's easy for high-end developer and also a beginner. Yeah, with Python, it's really easy to create extremely powerful things with a couple lines of code with the libraries that we'll mention. Like, for example, the email bot I've been talking about, that was under 20 lines of code. So Python is great, but I, I do think that the best language for beginners is still web development because that's the most gratifying, the earliest, in my opinion. Paul? Especially for website building, I think we touched on it earlier about uh, PHP. It sort of brings HTML, CSS, and JavaScript all together. And another language that I have experienced of using before is uh, MySQL. It's a language for like using and creating databases and tables. And I think those who are looking into sort of the data area of computing, I think SQL is a good one. Uh, I was about to say, actually, dare oh. I ask Tom a question here? The last yeah. time I think I asked him about this, he was talking to me about all kinds of obscure languages that he learned when he was at university, most of which I have to confess I'd never heard of. So I'm going to ask Tom, what do you think? Um, I agree with everyone. Oh. Okay. When I first started learning programming not long ago, I have to say I learned Pascal. Ooh. Yes. Yes. I'm old. <laughs> and after that, C, C+, Ball and C, and then Delphi. And of course, all of these managed to make who I am today, because as long as you can have a programming mind, you will be able to use a computer language to express your thoughts. And of course, I agree with Sam when he says it's powerful. OK, Python and Java, they're both powerful in their own way. Python is very good with students to learn their first language is simple. You will make mistakes, but the chance for you to have a large number of syntax error is greatly reduced when you compare to Java, when you compile something and nothing works. And there are like perhaps 20 error <laughs> and two warnings. And even with one error, it won't go through, right? But the thing is, sometimes it put people off. But of course, if you manage to start with something simple and gradually move on, increase the level of difficulty, you will be able to structure your mind so that you become a good programming mind. And later, when you have that programming knowledge in you, you can program in any language, as long as you know the syntax, of course. I totally agree. That's why I think JavaScript is the best first real okay. programming language to learn because I've got actual like evidence for this, okay? Yes. JavaScript is weakly typed and it does type juggling, right? So it's easy, to, you don't have to worry about types, right? You don't have to worry about what kind of variable it is. It'll just do it for you. And then Python, you move a little step up. It's still weakly typed, but at least it doesn't do type juggling. But you should know your type before you start programming. Well, but beginners, if you teach them about types, mm -hmm. they get confused very easily, right? And it depends whether you have a good teacher or not. It's good, actually, that Sam's talking like a teacher. You know, <laughs> That's great. Yes, yes. I enjoy having this kind of conversation with Sam. I just got burned again. No, 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 no. You're absolutely right. And if we have a good type, that will bring us back to MySQL because databases are always type intensive. We certainly do not want to create a database with a fixed length that is really, really long. And that is wrong. That's going to make your program look really, really clumsy. And of course, we can combine all, everything together. Yes. And Christy, I wanted to talk to you, obviously, given you're, you're only the one girl on, on the show today. Obviously, there are other good girls in the school for coding as well. We've obviously had things like FDMs, Girls in ICT Day, you know, which we have annually. And, you know, many of our girls in the past have attended that. And in fact, you know, we've won awards and things. Do you think from your position that there are still barriers for girls in this area? 
I think that while there are definitely less barriers right now as opposed to a few years ago, as promoting STEM education for girls has grown, but there are still barriers for girls、um, entering this field. It's male dominated. I mean, in coding club, I notice there are still more boys than girls.、Um, yeah, significantly, is, yeah. <laughs> with more opportunities like the girls in ICT Day by FDM, this has helped to maybe reduce that gap a bit, and has also helped promote things to more girls. And also with the introduction of coding to the syllabus and the curriculum, and also the integration of it in subjects like maths and science. Right now,、yep. we can definitely get more girls to come in and. Be exposed to more STEM. It's definitely interesting that a lot of the girls that I have through media studies, so AFP media, there is definitely a fear of coding to begin with, and many of them, you know, they're looking at any way that possible that could they do a kind of something similar but not have to code. And once they get into it, once they start to adopt the, the kind of mindset that Tom was talking about earlier on, that the kind of logical thinking that's required, and they start to understand how coding works, you can see suddenly there's a complete change, a shift in the attitude. Whether that's sustainable, whether that would mean that a lot of those same girls, if offered, you know, computer science pathway in years twelve and thirteen, would opt for it, I, I don't know. But I think sometimes it's simply a matter of, of insisting, you know, insisting that people try in the same way as we would、yep. in many other subjects. And so, if、down. I could just interject real quick, it's a bit of a catch twenty two here because the programming field is extremely, extremely male dominated, whether that be in the workplace or online or even throughout its history. I'd say the, the famous programmers are all guys, and that kind of fuels this perception to non-programmers that it's it's basically just for guys, and so that causes less women to join, which means more men join, which means it makes it even worse. It's just it's a cycle that keeps going. So to the listeners, if you are not sure and if you are a female, give it a shot. Even if you're male, but you know, give it a shot. And 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 it's not that male dominated as it seems. There are definitely famous females, for example, the the moon landing. The code written for that, the team lead was a woman, and also Chelsea Manning from FBI, CIA, also a woman. So there are definitely women women in this field, and we we need more. And they're being revised. They're being reclaimed, you know, from history and celebrated in yep. Yep. very different sort of TV programs.、Yeah. To finish off with today, regular listeners will know that I always like a takeaway of some kind, a sort of recommendation, if you will. I always tend to use an imaginary year seven student, so I'm going to give year seven a, a break today. I'm going to use a year eight instead. A radical change, okay?、Mm. So, come year ten, I'll have the chance to opt for computer science, yeah, with the mighty Tom Lee as my teacher. So, what can I do? I'm a current year eight. What can I do to develop my skills in coding before that time? Each of you has got thirty seconds, okay? Tom, you're up first. Okay. So, first of all, talk to Sam. Secondly, with a MacBook in front of us and a mobile phone in our pocket or on our desk, the pursuit of knowledge has never been easier these days. So, if you want to have a head start or in need of a hobby, simply start your favorite browser and Google "programming language for beginners." You will discover roughly 78 million results in roughly 0.56 seconds. And、um, there are websites, YouTube clips, free apps, blogs, online tutorials, and of course the BSD platform. Everything that you need to know about programming is just a few clicks away. Yep, thank you, Tom. I think that was pretty much thirty seconds as well. Will, what would be your recommendation? Yeah, I'd say exactly the same thing. There's so many, so many free courses online on how to code, like Udemy, Code Academy, Free Code Camp. There's so many that just pick one, sign up, choose your language, and then just practice, practice, practice. That's all I really. And then also find the projects that you want to do. And then, like, have that as your end goal. So learn until you can do that project. You know. Thank you, Will. Christy. I agree with Mr. Lee and Will. So practice more, do courses, read, watch videos, join the coding club, and use the BSD platform. It's free. Sam said before the school has paid for everyone's subscription, so why not use it? Yep,、yeah, it's a very powerful tool. I think for a lot of people, they're not even aware that it's there.、Uh, Sam. Yeah, open Firefox, the only correct browser, and then in DuckDuckGo, the only correct search engine, you go app.bst.education, sign in with your school email, do a course, try it, think of a project you want to do, do that, learn until you can do that, done, repeat, easy. Okay, thanks for that.、Some、controversy in there as well, hidden in those statements. Paul, keep practicing.、Uh, use Google as your friend. I'm sure all the coders will relate to that statement. 
Yeah. Yeah. Or duck, duck, go. Duck, yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. If you have a problem, if you're stuck with the code, use whatever search browser you're using as a friend. So that is just about all we have time for today. I'd like to thank my five guests. We will be taking a break for the next uh, few weeks or so. So we'd love to hear your thoughts on the show. What would you like us to discuss, for instance? If you do have any thoughts or questions or feedback, then please write to digileaders at webmail.sis.edu.hk. Thanks for listening.